for your host. Here she goes. Welcome to Diary of a Botox Bitch Podcast. Oh man, I can't get enough of your voice. Keep on talking. Hi, I'm Dr. Botox, Dr. Danielle Moore Collins, and you're listening to my podcast called Diary of a Botox Bitch. We're coming to you live from downtown Beverly Hills. It's actually 12 a.m., so it's a Sunday night. I've just come back from running around L.A. doing all the different clubs, and it's been a busy weekend. It's been a busy week, actually. I, on, th- on Tuesday night, I did the Belly Room in the Comedy Store, which is one of my favorite rooms, and it was a great crowd. It was an all-female lineup. It was super fun. In the middle of it, Bobby Lee comes up into the into the green room and like just it's so crazy and wonderful and magnificently fabulous it's just like whatever follow me on TikTok see the behind the scenes I do a little bit behind the scenes but for the most part we are not allowed to film in the rooms and we don't and we adhere to it we play by the rules because we want to you know constantly be back there and so it's just respectful no one wants their set recorded and actually what's amazing about in LA is if someone if an audience member they won't dare but if an audience member whipped up their camera and started recording, security would stop them and probably ask them to leave in the A-clubs, you know, in the big clubs, in, in the comedy store, which is the club you feel the safest at. Even the improv or, or the laugh factory, the same as well. Um, some of the some of the other clubs, you know, I was in a club once and I did a set and someone recorded my set and the whole way through I was like, why is no one... And actually, it's funny, this was about a year ago and I was more new to comedy, so I was like, oh, I don't want to say anything. Now I'd actually say, bro, I'd actually stop my set and be like, Stop fucking recording me. I wouldn't say fucking, but well, I might do. But the problem with that happens, though, is they they get angsty. And the thing is, what people don't realize about comedy is, you know, it's not like Taylor Swift where you've you've recorded your track and it's, you know, you wrote it in private and you record it in a studio and it's perfect. When we're working our sets out, be it, you know, you're working out your very, very raw stuff on an open mic with other, other comics on a Tuesday afternoon, whatever. But even now... I will do like a big joke at the start, a big closer in the middle. I'll work at some new stuff, not brand new stuff, but I'll try out some stuff that I've worked in an open mic and I'll work the kinks out. So we're constantly iterating. We're constantly working out our stuff. We're almost like writing the song in live time. And of course, when you do have that tight five minutes, it becomes part of a chunk of another tight five minutes, which will lead to 10 minutes, to 12 minutes, to 15 minutes, which will be what builds ultimately to your 45 minute or your one hour special, whenever that is. And so... If someone posts a joke, which is why also a lot of comics don't post jokes, there's a real debate going on at the moment. Do you post your jokes? I'll post maybe one old joke every now and again, but I don't want to give away my jokes. Then I have one really good joke, the Crenshaw joke, which I use a lot now as my closer and I've moved it up the top. Um, I have a Botox closer now, but you don't want to give away your jokes. I'm not giving them away for free on social media. You want people to come and see the shows, but also what you want is that, you know, ultimately that will be, I always say comedy is like this. Sometimes I used to say it's like it's like a bookshelf where you have a bookshelf with all the books on the shelf. And depending on the crowd you get up, you'll suss the crowd, you'll be watching the crowd beforehand and you'll look and you'll be observing and you'll see what's working or what sort of crowd. You know, are they a rowdy crowd? Are they just come in from happy hour in the bar? Are they are they really drunk? Like, are they a bit slow? Are they a clever crowd? Are they, you know, but, you know, whatever. There's certain rooms as well. In certain areas you're like, we're not the brightest. And then other rooms you're like, you got to be quick, quick, quick because these people are quick and they get it. So... I was just, so you know what your set list is before you go up and you know what you're going to say and all that. But I always say comedy is a little bit, I used to say it was like a bookshelf with all the, the books on it. And you would pick out, you know, you'd, you'd be watching and you kind of know on the way what you're going to do and then you'd finalize, I'm going to do that order. And you'd pick out the books. But I feel like that's not a good example because a book is fully bound. The manuscript is done. It's, it's sealed, sal- delivered. I think a better analogy is almost to think of comedy like a flower seller, you know, where... There's a bunch of flowers that's fully ready to be sold, which is your big opener, your big closer. Then there's other bunches of flowers and water that are still growing, that are maybe about to bloom, but not quite there yet. And it doesn't mean you can't use them in your set. And I also like the idea of this because flowers will grow and bloom and leaves will fall off because sometimes there's jokes. Like there's a tag I used to always use. I have this joke where I go, the Real Housewives of Ireland is a lot like the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, but less money, a lot less money. And then I do another joke about Celebrity Big Brother. And then I had a, a third tag which was kind of a personal tag. And in certain rooms that works and in certain rooms they're like, ooh, and you're like, okay. And it's funny, you can address this on stage and be like, oh, too much West Hollywood or too much Burbank. And they're like, ooh, and you kind of, you know, you you move with the crowd. You know, I did a joke recently. I think it was, I think it was last month. And we had been talking about me joining a particular show. And 
I said something about something else and then they were, ooh, and I was like, relax, everybody. And I talked about the fact that I'm the great grandniece of Michael Collins, so I was political, you know, family ties, whatever. And so they were, I don't know what it was, but there was just a little glitch and I was like, relax, everybody. I'm not running for office. I'm running for such and such a show. Everyone relax, whatever. So you can address these things, but ideally as well, you know, you don't have to, it's not a big deal. It's fun sometimes when something impromptu like that happens. But here's the deal. I think comedy is really like a flower seller who has loads of different bunches of flowers growing up in Dublin we used to have more streets so they would be selling apples and oranges and flowers and even on Grafton Street which is the main street in Dublin there's loads of fabulous flower sellers they're salt of the earth hilarious women like literally um, they're all you know city centre ladies they're hilarious they're just like so funny and so I feel like comedy is almost it's not like a bookshelf because the bookshelf the books are all bound and finalised and whatever and comedy is constantly fluid you're constantly adding a tag taking away something iterating something something happens you go actually that's a really good way to do that so I feel like comedy yeah I do I feel like it's very much like a big flower seller stand and I think certain comedians as well will have bunches and bunches they'll have you know a career of 22 years they'll have almost like have a, a street corner with all different stands and stands upon their stands or whatever but at this point in time you know I've got my my jokes that are are done and cooked and they're fully re- like almost like someone could come along and buy the bunch of flowers that doesn't mean I won't take out one flower or change a tag or or whatever and also the order as well you might have a blue bunch a red bunch the order you change up the order depending on the room it also depends on the set like for example if I'm doing a 12 minute set it's chill you can ease into it a little crowd work if you're doing a 5 minute set it I will say it needs to be as tight as a nun's see you next Tuesday um if you're doing a three minute set, it means you need to be straight in and you need to like hit the first beat, joke, joke, joke. So comedy is so interesting. It's such a puzzle and I have such an analytical mind. So I think it's really, it's pretty fab from that point of view. Um, the roundup of the last week was I had a great set on Tuesday night and I'd actually had 10 days off because I had a, that stupid darn flu or cold or whatever. I got tested for COVID. It said no, but I don't know anyway, whatever. So I'd had a little bit of time off and I was actually going, oh gosh, I feel like, you know, it's like a workout. You know, you're you're not you're not using your muscles and I thought maybe I'll be slow getting back into it. But actually sometimes I think just having that little break was really good for me. And so I had a great set. I had actually a really good set. It was like one of my best sets. And then Friday was like the best set of my life. And Friday was interesting because Friday, the 19th of January was my one year anniversary of doing comedy in LA. I mean, I had done comedy in England 10, 11 years ago. I dipped in, I dipped out, I did Celebrity Big Brother and then I was like, oh, people know who I am. I don't want to, you know, I'm just going to, it was just like, in England they're tough as well. The tabloids are tough and the crowds are tough. I mean, I think they throw beer bottles and stuff in England. I don't know. I did Comedia in Brighton, so I had a great time. I always talk about Jill Edwards as well, who's a great, a great advocate for new comics and I did her course like 11 years ago. Then when I came here, I did a lot of stuff with Pretty Funny Women and the alumni and I still do those shows and they're all female shows and they're great and you know, it's it's cool. And it's funny, I dipped in that and then when I did Celebrity Big Brother, I was like, oh, everyone knows who I am. I don't want to, you should be quite vulnerable on stage, but I feel like this is such a happy environment and such a gentle parenting environment almost. It doesn't mean you don't bomb. Of course, sometimes things don't work or whatever. Or we were talking about this this evening. <laughs> I did a show back in June and it was an, a very urban room and it was like White Becky was the only girl. Irish Becky, Irish cuz. And my friend, one of my friends was like, you should quit walk on a stage. And I was like, I don't think I should quit walking on the stage. He was like, it's fine, fuck it, do it. I was like, so anyway, they play Snoop G thing and I'm like, do, 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 like whatever. And I'm like, it was funny, it was funny. And, you know, there was some old aunties in the front row and sometimes this happens as well. Sometimes I go on stage and I feel like I'm real housewives, like, you know, I have Gucci and Chanel earrings and stuff. But then I always have like, I don't want to wear heels on stage, so I'll always have sneakers so I typically have a pair of Jordans or I might have my Panda Dunks whatever in fact I'm not really a Dunks girl I just have Jordans but um just like Air Ones but like sometimes the Panda Dunks are cute for wearing with like black trousers or whatever and a black suit jacket but typically I have to now make a joke because I have to be like I know I know it's like Real Housewives on Top Love and Hip Hop the TV show down below and then I'll you know I do a little, another little joke and a tag or whatever but it's funny whatever like when I first arrived here, I used to wear this Lakers jacket the whole time because I wanted everyone to remember who I was and be like, oh, yeah, that's that's Irish Becky. It's the Irish girl. She wears a Lakers jacket. And after about 10 minutes, everyone's like, why are you wearing the Lakers jacket? I was like, well, you know, just so people know, everyone's like, everyone knew who the fuck you were within about 10, 10 days of arriving on the scene because I, I took some time out where the pandemic struck. And during the pandemic, I didn't want to perform in car parks and all that sort of stuff, which is, is bad because a lot of people did and they're further along in their careers. But that's okay as well. We don't, I don't compare myself to anyone. I, com- I compare myself to me yesterday or me last year or something. But comparison is a great stealer of joy in your life, you know. So I don't know. But, but, but also as well, maybe I'm just older as well and more, you've been through more and you, I don't know, who knows what the answer is. There's no set way for anything. 
But I did take some time out and then I went back. So from 19th of January, 2023, I went hard. I went hard, like every day open mics. I just hard, 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 hard. I feel like I did almost three years of comedy in one year. I just like I went hard. So it was my one year anniversary of performing comedy in L.A. the 19th of January. And I, like I said, I've been dipping in and out for 10, 11 years. But I had the best show of my life on that night. So it was such a joy. And I came home and I was just like, it's funny as well, when you're doing what you're meant to do, I think it happens. Like the doors open, and it's very organic or something. I don't know. I've done stuff before where I feel like it's not for me, but I push through and I'm like, I want this. And then you realize you're into it and you're like, ugh, that wasn't meant for me. You know, I don't know how to explain it. You know, sometimes as well, like sometimes silly things happen. I be, I've begun to be quite... I don't know, just I feel like sometimes things are not meant for you and you can push. And if you're powerful and driven and ambitious, like someone like me can push through and get something that may not be exactly meant for me. And it can feel like it's meant for you. But then a year or two, you're like, it's like me working full time as a Botox doctor. I used to do six days a week. I was very unhappy. I was burnt out. As I've gotten older, my creative side needs to be fueled like more than anything. The Botox I can do in my sleep. It's not challenging. I do it because I have lovely patients and I do because I want to give safe treatments. And there's a lot of lunatics out there. Doing aesthetic treatments, I, I, you know, I go home every whatever, 12 weeks and I'll blast through everybody and make sure everyone's taken care of. And then I'm happy to just, you know, go, OK, that's that everyone's taken care of. I can go back into creative. What fuels my heart and fuels my soul is comedy. Hanging out of the clubs, watching the greats, you know, just learning and just watching someone as well set up a joke and be like, oh, that's a rule of three or that's a switch and bait. And then be like, oh, my God, it's not. Oh, my God, they did this and it's a double, double switch. Like, it's just fascinating to me. I think there's a great sense of camaraderie. You know, are there a few people who are? Yeah, probably. And there's also probably a few people as well who don't want to see you do well. And again, that's like what people think of me is none of my business. I mean, I don't have time for it. I'm also as well, there's certain days we all know this in life as well. You don't need to be running. You don't need to be. You just need to be always moving forward. So just be always putting one foot after the other. If you can't, if you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. It just, it doesn't matter. You don't need to beat yourself up. You just one foot after another. And also, if you run too fast as well, you'll miss. Like, I see someone said this to me on stage as well. If you not rush your set, but if you're kind of flying through it, or you feel like you've, like I have a joke that is a good closer joke, but it can take forty five seconds by the time you set up. It's a great payoff. So I've, tra- I've changed it out, actually. I'm closing at the moment with a Botox joke because it's a very tight joke and it can be 12 or 13 seconds because what happens in comedy is you're doing your set and say you're doing 10 minutes, you'll get the light at nine. So you have to wrap it up and get off stage. You can't run the light. That's like not allowed. So having a big closer that takes 45 seconds to really set up well for the good payoff is great. But also I like to have a little bit of, you know, crowd work and just like if it comes up. So... I found that a clever thing to do is have a joke that's really, really tight. That's a really, really good joke and it's really tight, but also allows you to breathe in between. So if you're hitting that joke, so for example, the Crenshaw joke, I love as my closer, is my favorite closer. But if I hit that joke, if I get the light and I'm fin- finishing off another section of, of another bit and I get the light and I'm 30 seconds and I only have 30 seconds left, then I can't really do justice to that that joke that takes 45 minutes for a setup on the payoff. So I've now switched it up. And these are just things you learn from doing comedy. I have a Botox joke now, which is a 15 second joke, but I can also puff it out and, you know, let it breathe. Like the joke is basically, and it's one joke I've actually put online. It's an oldie, but a goldie. So you get the light. And if I'm already 30 seconds finishing off the last bit, I will just go in and hit this and I'll just do it in 15 or 22 seconds. And then I'll get off stage. But if I get the light and I'm just hitting the joke, I can actually let it breathe. I can add in a few other lines. And, you know, I did the, sh- the joke the other night. It's basically what I say is I go, people always ask, what's the best bang for your buck? And some people want it in the face. You know, it lasts three to four months. And then other people want it along the jaw, which is super snatched. But then, of course, there's always someone who wants it in the neck. And you've got to be super careful because too many units in the neck, you're going to relax the breathing apparatus. And I, again, sassy, you're going to need to be intubated. No panic, only three to four months. It'll wear off, you'll be back breathing independently in no time. So there's a 15 second joke. It's very, very tight. Now, if I get the light and I know I have a minute left and that's 15 seconds, I can actually let that joke breathe. So I'll, I'll then go, hey, everyone, you know, you guys, I got to get out of here. But just to let you know, 
everyone asks me what's the best bang for your Botox buck and then I can do a little crowd work I'll be like who gets Botox here and it was funny on Friday night I did that who gets Botox here no one said anything I said shut the fuck up it's West Hollywood you lying motherfuckers and then a few hands go up like I'm not even asking about Ozempic you guys I'm just asking about Botox who gets Botox and some of us are hand up whatever and I go and how long does it last ma'am you know or sir how long does it last and it's like three to four months and then you have to repeat it back three to four months and then if I, if I know I have a good minute, I can kind of have a little b- bit of fun and be like, you guys, you know, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. I had my Botox done last Wednesday. I had so much Botox in my forehead. I can't even move my forehead at all, which is actually true. If you see, I can't move my forehead at all. And so I said, guys, you know, what? I had so much Botox, I can barely even move my fucking legs, you know, and I have a bit of play or whatever. And then someone else might say something and go, what's that, mom? And oh, you have Botox too, great job, whatever. And then, I, and then I can cut into the joke and say, you know, people ask me what's the best bang for your book. Like the lady here said, it lasts three to four months. And, you know, I always say to people, you know, everyone wants it in the face. Last three to four months. And some people want to have it along the jaw, which is great. It's super snatched, man. But that'll be a super snatched job. And then, of course, some people want to have it in the neck and too many units of Botox in the neck. You're going to relax the breathing apparatus. You're going to need to be intubated. Don't worry. No panic. No panic. Same as the face, and I'll point to the lady in the crowd, isn't that right, ma'am? It only lasts three to four months. You'll be back breathing independently in no time. No tubes, for real. And so that allows me either have, if the light has gone off and I'm 30 seconds finishing off a last, but then I need to get in that really tight in 14 or 15 seconds. And this is just a trick of the trade. You only learn this from being on stages. Or I can have this joke that I know if the light goes, I know it's a 15 second joke, but a little crowd work, I can make it, you know, use up my whole minute and stuff. But these are just tricks of the trade, you know. And it's funny, I don't typically tell a lot of Botox jokes, and I probably should tell more jokes. I, I, I started to tell jokes as well about, you know, medical jokes and what happens if there's a medical emergency on the airplane. And, you know, we're not God. I'm the same as everyone else. I just want to sit back, relax, have a couple of Valium, drink a litre of liquid from the Champagne region of France. You know, we're, we're the same as everyone else. I'm just selling into a first class. You know, I don't take Valium or whatever, but it's a funny joke. I don't even drink really, to be honest with you. But I should probably do more medical jokes and I don't know why I don't do it. It's feel, I feel like I just feel like a lot of my adult life was dealing with patients and clinics and... I don't know. I don't even know, actually. Who knows? But anyway, it is what it is. I'm wearing a really furry, cozy jacket. I have it in pink as well because it's actually freezing here at the moment. Um, And everyone's been getting sick and whatever. So it's good to be cozy. It's very good to be cozy. Now, as you know, this show is sponsored by Dermaface MD Skincare. And I want to just talk about this for a moment. This is the Dermaface MD 1000X Advanced Hyaluronic Acid, which is really interesting because what people don't know is that Hyaluronic is when we're born, we've lots of hyaluronic in the body. And this is the section, as we call Botox, I guess. We have a lot of hyaluronic in the body and our face is like a V shape. As we get older, that V shape goes this way, if that makes sense. So, um, so I'm knocking the microphone. So as we get older, the V shape goes like this to this, an inverted V shape. So you want to have always lifting everything up. The really interesting thing about topical hyaluronic serum is that it is, it's great in some ways, but it's much more difficult to get it to absorb. So if you're having filler injected in your lips or your nasolabials or in your marionette lines the filler is direct, directly delivered via needle and of course filler is a, is hyaluronic you know so it's delivered directly via needle so even if you have big molecules because the bigger the molecule the more plump you'll get with the hyaluronic so if you have big molecules it's fine because they're delivering it via needle and the difference with a topical hyaluronic such as this and again if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on podcast uh, video, you can see the product. It's Dermaface MD. And again, if you wish to purchase this, you can have Botox Bitch 25 for 25% off and go to the website. And this is an advanced 1000X Hyaluronics. Now, very interestingly enough, this is the new blue Navy medical bottle. I do have some bottles left in white and they're actually 40% off and not for any other reason. It's the exact same formulation. But I have another brand, Dermaface MD, because I'm dual qualified as a, a dentist and an a, aerospace engineer. My other brand, Aerospace MD, the final iteration is going to launch in white so I wanted to just differentiate so over the next year we're going to phase out the white Dermaface MD Hyaluronic so it's just interesting it's the exact same product and I'm not about here trying to sell everything to everyone I'm like you know what if you are at the $200 mark for a Hyaluronic or a product and you prefer another founder's story or the branding or the colour more than mine buy it am I here going it's the number one product at $200 really there isn't much difference between mine and others so buy mine don't buy mine like whatever I'm not going to lie to you I'm just be like yeah if you like it and you like my story, buy it. If you don't, buy Bernadette's or, or whatever. Or, you know, I'm I'm pretty chill, whatever. So back to how topical hyaluronic works. Typically what you want to do is just 
have your face wet and then you want to just tap it in. Also, quite, what's quite helpful, I feel, is to use a gua sha because the gua sha needs slippage and that's provided by the, the Dermaface MD Hyaluronic. But also the gua sha will push the product into the skin a little bit, I feel personally. So the difference with topical hyaluronic is that you have to have a mix of a medium weight and a heavy weight hyaluronic and probably attach something like a fatty acid lipid tail so it will hopefully be drawn into the skin. But again, the real challenge is having molecules of hyaluronic in a topical product that are really, really big that will plump up the skin, but also that will pass the skin barrier because there's no point in having a big plumpy up molecule if you can't get the, the bloody thing to go into the skin barrier. So it's really important to have well, what I formulated as a medium weight combined with a, a heavier weight like 940 Dalton uh, with the hope that it will literally be absorbed and being drawn, you know, across the skin barrier and give the hydration that's needed. And again, my story is quite simple. I had some skin cancers. They were removed before I did the Celebrity Big Brother house. And I was actually taking out my own sutures in the mirror. And when I came back, then I had to have Effudex, which was very, very aggressive. And my skin barrier was broken. And so about six years ago, I was kind of playing around formulating products in Ireland. And it was a real case of clinician heal thyself. That's why I say if you like my founder story, that's fine. If you don't like that's grand, just buy the other the other brand. I don't, I don't really mind. But I formulated the product. And then again, at the start of the pandemic, I had another Mohs surgery here. You can still see the scar. And again, I had to play around. I realized there's amazing labs here in California. There's amazing ingredients that can be sourced. And I was like, this is kind of cool. And then throughout the, the pandemic, I just formulated these products. So it's super exciting. We do live selling on TikTok uh, most every other day. And again, I try and pack as many of the boxes myself and write notes to people and whatnot. So it's kind of super exciting and I love it. And again, I'm also, as I'm getting older, well, I was going to say I, I get less injections, which is, you know, Tuesday of last week. No, sorry, Tuesday, almost two weeks ago, I had Botox done. And again, it kicked in on Tuesday of last week. So a week in it was kicked in. And I literally, I have no movement on my forehead at all whatsoever. And I have to say, I fucking love it. Um, like I said on stage the other night, I was like, I can barely move my legs. I have so much Botox, which is kind of fun. So it, it is what it is. Sometimes at this point in the show as well, I'll do a little reading of an excerpt from my book, Diary of a Botox Bitch. I always joke I come from a big political family. And, um, you know, I say a lot of my family are running for office and trial attorneys. And then there's me, Dr. Botox. But no worries, my own political biopic drops next month. It's called Diary of a Botox Bitch. My podcast, the same name, Diary of a Botox Bitch is I think it's ranking number seven in the Irish podcast charts. And I said on stage, I said, oh, no, no, don't clap, don't clap. I said, there's probably only 11 podcasts, but it's fun. The Americans are really fun. They're very gentle parenting. They're very supportive. No one's ever like, people are so impressed that you get up on stage. But again, with your peers, there's always, there's always that wanting to really have jokes that land and to work hard. And funny enough as well, like I like sometimes to be, you know, in a casual sweatshirt and, Sometimes even, like I said, the Lakers jacket I wore for 10 months and I said to everyone so that everyone would know who I was. They were like, you're the only Irish comic. Of course we know who you are. We knew who you were from like day 10. I was like, okay, that's so cute. So I am dressing more and more like at the moment when I go on stage, I'm dressing, dressing more like Real Housewives vibe. You know, like not like not like stuffy, stuffy, but like I'll wear like a little jacket like this or I wear it in pink or, you know, I'm not wearing like braises and stuff. And then I'll have the Chanel earrings and, you know, I might have a little like a little bangle or whatever. And, you know, and I'll just a little just a little like the lashes are back on, which is very housewivesy. But again, I feel like in this town and with everything that's going on in terms of stuff, projects that I might do, it's kind of better to be less tomboy. But again, on stage, I don't really like to wear heels because I want to be I really feel like I need to be grounded. If I was playing a role where I wanted to be. You know, if I was playing a crazy person or something, I would probably wear heels because I would feel quite <laughs> uncentered in heels uh, while performing, be it on stage as stand-up comedy or filming. I don't know. Anyway, that's just my take on all of that. Uh, regarding The Real Housewives uh, of Salt Lake City, I'm watching that. I think it's really, really fun. They're all crazy. I think it's really interesting. And actually, very funnily enough, at the moment, I did a movie in the summer, which is called... Well, actually, I can't give the name of what it's called because it's actually up for it's actually in Sundance at the moment in the slam dance section. It's, well, it's called All I've Got and Then Some. And it's a great movie. It's a it's a comedy movie. It's a it's a wonderful movie. It's really fabulous. I was at the screening back in September and they've now taken it to the film festival. And I really hope they win and I'm rooting for them. But the funny thing is, as well, is when you are do that was that was a nice role. It was it was easy. I didn't have to wear heels or anything, but. When you're doing playing different characters, it's good to do things that throw you off kilter or I don't know. I mean, that's just what I think. And again, my real thing would be I'd love to be in a sitcom and a half hour in America that runs for five or six seasons. And everyone's like, oh, the money. It's not really the money. I just would like 
to I like to work in the same clubs. I like to work on the same set. I'm always at, at the end of filming and thing. I'm always sad that, we, that, you know, the fan breaks up or whatever. So it'd be nice to be on a set that's going to, you know, film for three or four months of the year every year and use the same people and it's like I love going to the comedy clubs as well you always have the same people and the servers and the managers and the door people I mean they're just all part of a big wonderful family and each club has its own family which is kind of cool so so yeah that's it for my episode this week and again huge thank you to our sponsors Dermaface MD Skincare a thousand X Hyaluronic Skincare and we will talk very soon and that's it for me from Diary of a Botox Bitch I know it's exactly what you've been waiting for, so let's do this. Welcome to the segment we call Bow Talks. Let's talk all things Botox, filler, and skincare. 